This is Evangelist Patrick Talbert. Glad to be with you again today. We're going to continue a series of lessons we've been teaching, and we're going to start. Uh, we've learned a lot from people in the past, Dr. Bill Glass, C.S. Lovett, Dr. Bragg, Dr. Ron Riley, Dr. Scotty Drake, Dr. Clemens, Dr. Bradley, have taught us many things about Christian growth. <clears throat> and once a person has accepted Jesus into his life, her life, their life, the Bible says they're born again. And the process after they're born again starts on Christian growth. In the church today, Christian growth, the theological word for it is sanctification, but it's actually growing to be like Christ. They say you watch your thoughts because they become your words. You watch your words, they become your actions. You watch your actions, they become your habits. And you watch your habits, so they become your character, and you watch your character, it becomes your destiny. So in a series of lessons that we've taught in the past here, we talked about thinking patterns or thinking errors. You have what you call closed channel, a lack of receptivity, failure to disclose, and lack of self-criticism. Uh, it goes into what we call thinking errors. or 16 basic thinking errors. And what we do as Christians and as people that are lost, we put on masks and we cover up all these errors. And we wear a mask so we can have a fight on the way to the church and then walk in and smile at everybody and tell everybody praise the Lord and all this. We wear masks. And there's 18 different masks a person can wear to cover up what's going on in the heart. The Bible says in Psalms 95, 40 years long was I grieved with this generation and said it is a people that do err in their hearts and have not known my ways. Knowing the ways of God and doing the ways of God is very important. In Isaiah 53, 6, he said he went astray, gone his own way. God has a way and we have a way. And the real problem is, is our ways are not God's ways. And the Bible tells us that we need to engraft James 1, 21, God's word into our hearts in order to be conformed into his image. And David said in Psalms 51, restore to me, Lord God, the joy of my salvation. He says, uh, forgive me, he said, of my iniquities and my sins. The iniquity is the heart problem. The sin is the outward part of what comes out of the heart. He says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. What we're going to be talking about here is how to change a person's life. I was in the hospital here Sunday after church to see a man, 76 years old, and the nurse walked in right in front of me and she said, may I talk with him for a moment? And I said, yes. And she says, sir, you've only got a, a few days to live. We're going to put you on morphine and some other drugs and stuff so you won't have no pain, but you're dying and you don't have long to live. And we just want to let you know what's going to happen. You might lose conscience and stuff like that, she says, but we're going to take away the pain. You let us know how we can help you. He thanked her, and I walked up to him, and I said, Now, I'm a preacher, and I come here. My son had been there and gave him the gospel and asked him to pray about it and think about it, and I went back by to see him. And I said, Now, Johnny, uh, she just told you you're going to die, and you're, going, you're not going to live a few more days, maybe a week, and they're going to put you on this morphine to take away your pain and everything, but if you die, do you know for sure if you go to heaven? He said, No. I says, well, basically, the Bible says you can know for sure that you're going to go to heaven. Uh, I says, have you ever thought about, have you ever sinned in your life? And he said, yes, I've told a lie before. I've sinned. I've done things wrong. I said, well, you and I are the same then. We both done sin. And the Bible says all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But he says that uh, there's a wage for sin, and that is death. You're dying. But he says... The wages of sin is death, but God's gift is eternal life. So God has a gift for you of eternal life. And he said in John 1, 12, if you receive him, he gives you power to become the sons of God. A lot of people believe in Jesus. Even the devil believes in Jesus. But they won't receive him. Jesus says in Revelation 3, 20, I stand at the door and knock. He said, behold, I stand at this door and knock. He said, if you open the door, I will come in. The Lord Jesus is waiting to come into your heart, Johnny, I told him. 
So would you allow him to come into your heart and accept his payment on the cross and the blood that he shed for you as a payment for all your sins and the penalty for your sins? Would you accept that? He says, yes. And we prayed. He prayed and asked Jesus to come into his heart. And I said, now i got good news for you, Johnny. She says, what's that? I says, Johnny, uh, the lady just told you you had two weeks to live and you're going to die. I said, I've got good news for you. Uh, you lived in the Seminole Heights area here in the Tampa area that uh, I've been around. And I know where you lived and everything. I said, how many houses you lived in? He said, oh, three or four. I said, you can go to each one of them and you can show me each house you used to live in, right? He said, yes, but you moved out of them. I said, what's happening is, is you're going to move out of this body, but God promised you a new body and a place in heaven. So you're just transferring. You're moving out of this body, going to a new body. In heaven, you're getting a glorified body God's going to give you, and you're going to be transferred. He says, he says uh, this uh, in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I, he said, I don't want you to be ignorant of this thing. He says, in my father's house, there's many mansions, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he just lit up like a, like a bulb because the lady just told him he was going to die, and I just told him he's going to live. He's going to live in a new body. He's going to be promoted. And that just happened uh, a couple of days ago. That's how God works in the divine appointments and doing these things. And what we're talking about here today is after a man gets saved, this man won't have time to get the Christian growth that another Christian would might have. But God wants us, as we get saved, and we get saved and trust Jesus, He wants us to put off the old man and put on the new. I go to Daytona every year. I've been down there for 30-some years now with Dr. Ron Riley, the Ambassador for Christ, at the 404-229-8453. We take youth groups from all over the United States come in there, and we pray and fast on Tuesday and do a lot of teaching and discipleship with the young kids and then we take them out on the beaches at spring break there and tell people about Jesus and they introduce people to Jesus and this brochure here if you want one of these you call Dr. Ron Riley at that number for the ambassadors for Christ this is his 56 year gone Daytona at spring break introducing people to Jesus Christ so keep that in mind just like I did the man yesterday you can do that in your young people. It'll bring them back another person uh, after their teaching, the discipleship training they give them, and the soul winning. They'll come back a different person and fire up your youth group in your church. But you had a man way back years ago whose name was Christopher Columbus, and he set out to find a passage to Asia. And when he set out, he didn't know where he was going, didn't know how he was going to get there. And when he arrived, he didn't know where he was. And he come back, he didn't know where he came from. So basically, he didn't have the navigation, the charts that he needed to get to where he wanted to go. If you ever tried to tackle a problem and you had no clue how to do it, uh, you have a, we had a problem with a truck yesterday, broke down, a diesel truck, and we're trying to get it to start, it wouldn't start. And we didn't know how to diagnose it. We went on YouTube, we went on all kind of programs and stuff, we couldn't figure out what was causing it to turn over, it wouldn't start. So there's a big problem. You got to go to the technician to find out what it is. Well, we got to do the same thing. Uh, the Bible teaches that a person becomes a Christian by accepting Jesus as his personal savior and his substitute for the penalty for his sins. But once he becomes a child of God, God begins the process. The Holy Spirit in Romans, uh, uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, he says, baptizes them into the body of Christ. And when they're baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and lives within them. And that Holy Spirit starts a change in their life to develop them into the image of Christ. He tells us in the Scriptures, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So the Christian growth process begins once a person accepts Jesus. Uh, we call this 
discipleship in the churches. They disciple a person in doing this. I've had many people I've taken, I've walked with them, I've talked with them, and I've sat, done classes with them and doing stuff, and I've got uh, spent many hours with them. Some of them are on the mission field today. Some of them are uh, so winning in their churches. Some of them are teaching. Some of them are pastors because we help disciple them from what we learned from these other men of God and stuff that taught us these things. So we're going into a series of lessons here basically on what we call biblical change. Once a person's saved and they've got Jesus in his heart, God uses many things to accomplish this change in their life. He says in Romans 5, 3 through 5, Tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, experience hope. Hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. So what we find here is, through the work of the Holy Spirit, God will use certain things in our lives, tribulations, trials, adversities. Uh, he'll use the local church to teach us. He'll use Christian friends to teach us. He uses the biggest thing is the Word of God and the Spirit of God. He says in 2 Peter 1, 5, and besides this, add to your faith. Now he wants you to add and start growing. Add to your faith virtue, to your virtue knowledge, to your knowledge temperance, to your temperance patience, to your patience. And he goes on. There's an addition Christian growth that God wants us to have after we receive Jesus. The process of change we call Christian growth uh, is called sanctification, but we're going to discuss in, in these lessons here the, pro, the, the progression of this and how to walk a person through this and how to help them in these lessons. I used to go by from a food pantry we preached at and people would get saved. I said, man, we come by and read some stuff to talk about and read and go over the scripture with you and they'd say yes and I'd go by and see them, go into their house and they couldn't get in the house, I'd bring them out and set them in the car or the van we was in, and we'd do a lesson there. We'd do it on the back porch in the backyard. We'd do a lesson. When I, can I come back? Well, sure, you can come back. And, and after about a month or so of that, I was going to five houses every day doing Bible lessons with them on Christian growth and grafting the Word of God into their lives, teaching them to, and, and, and the Bible says, if you meditate upon these things, you'll prosper and good, have good success in Joshua 1.8. And I was teaching them how to take Bible verses and meditate on them, and then how to pray. And we taught them the ABCs of prayer and how to pray and do these things. And we were helping the new Christian to do this. And we was up to about 25 homes a week going into them. Uh, and after the first month, we had 14 of them come to church. Uh, three or four were baptized uh, from the new birth to what we call the process of Christian growth. The churches uh, have lost the art of discipleship, which the Bible tells us in the, the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. Uh, if a person's not, uh, I, I check a church out by the fruit of the church. How many missionaries you got come out of your church? How many pastors have been called to preach from your church? How many full-time Christian servants do you have in a Bible college or out on the mission field or out on the bus ride or teaching or what they're doing? Uh, how many youth pastors do you have coming out of your church working in youth ministries and stuff? What is the fruit of your church? Are you discipling people? So the process of change, this sanctification we call, it doesn't happen all at once. It's a growth. And this process of this growth and this change in the Bible is called Christian growth or what we call growing in grace. In 2 Peter 3.18 he says, but grow in grace. We're saved by grace. We're to grow in grace. He said, how do you grow in grace? He said, he gives grace, more grace to the humble. Where sin abounds, grace is much more abound. He said, if you get under the authority in 1 Peter 5.5, 5, submit yourselves to the authority and humble yourself, God gives grace to the humble. So a person grows and grace and grows in different areas. So whenever you see the phrase change or grow or become like Christ, biblical change, we're talking about the biblical doctrine of the change or the new growth, putting off the old man, putting on the new. He talks about here in Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. Uh, our sea captain, though, is not Christopher Columbus. Our sea captain is Jesus Christ. He tells us in Hebrews, he's the captain of our faith. And the same way 
if you understand the basis of biblical change and help others do this, then you make disciples and helping others. It's not just a change, uh, any change that we're talking about. Uh, we got a guy one time who had a teenager who was out of, out of hand. They took the keys from his car away, so he straightened up. But he didn't straighten up uh, for the glory of God. He straightened up to get his keys back. A lady was going through a problem with her husband. He was an alcoholic, and he, she went through a divorce, and uh, the divorce didn't help solve the real problem, see. Uh, a, a guy was trying to get better grades. This young girl was in school, and she found a boyfriend. He was smart and everything, and that motivated her to start getting better grades. Those are changes that take place, but not the things we're talking about. Here's a dock worker working on the dock. He couldn't get along with his boss and everything, and he, he uh, Finally, they got uh, transferred to another location, and he was happy about that. But the real problem uh, is not the alcoholic husband. It's not the car problem. It's not the foreman on the dock. The real problem is the sin in the heart. Uh, we've got to do an MRI on the heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked in Jeremiah 17, 9, the Bible says. So he says in the scriptures, we're going to go through a filling of the Spirit when we get Jesus. And then we go through the testing. He says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you. Uh, we go through test. Uh, it could be the fiery trial of burst of anger and grief and lust in your life. It could be infirmities, physical limitations and illnesses. It could be reproaches, uh, ridicule and re uh, what we call a rejection of holiness and ridicules in our life could be necessities, daily responsibilities we have to go through every day, deep hurt and disappointments through distress, tribulation, usually uh, unusual pressures that God allows come into our lives. Now these pressures God's using and the people he's using to bring up what's in our heart, temptations, opportunity to fulfill them secret desires. David says in Psalms 51, he says, uh, uh, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. He says, and the Lord, uh, take away the sins of my iniquity and my heart in verse 2. He talks about his iniquity in his heart in verse 5 of Psalms 51. Verse 9, he says, the iniquity is in the heart uh, and the sin. So he separates the sin, the outward act, from what's in the heart. So the real problem goes much deeper and reminds us of the importance of biblical principles of understanding about change. The greatest problem is not around us. The greatest problem is within us. It's in our heart. Jesus said it this way in Mark 7, 21 through 23, for from within, out of the heart of men proceeds evil thoughts. So it comes from within. So the adultery, the fornication, the wickedness, the deceitfulness, the bitterness, the lasciviousness, the moral impurity, all comes from within. And the Bible says in James 4, 1, that they defile the man. Since a man uh, fell in the Garden of Eden, uh, he tried to blame it on somebody else. Adam blamed it on Eve. Eve blamed it on the serpent. But you see, the pressure of the adversity brings out what's in the heart. We've got a heart change when we get Jesus in our heart, but we've got to put on the new man now. It's like a tea bag here. I got a tea bag here. I put it in a cup of hot water. When I put this in hot water, it puts the flavor of the tea into the water and you drink it and you got a different flavor than the water had. The tea bag had the flavor in it, but it took hot water to bring it out. The trials and pressures of life bring out what's inside your heart. Somebody could hurt you and you can get mad at them and you want to hurt them. That's what's in your heart. Jesus was beaten with stripes, put on the cross, and his heart come out and he says, Father, forgive them for they didn't know what they do. Paul and Silas were preaching in Philippi and when they were preaching there, uh, the multitudes got mad at them and they took them and they ripped their clothes off of them and beat them with stripes, the Bible says. Then they put them in prison and put them in locks with guards on them. What come out of their heart? Did they want to get even? Did they want to tell them off? Did they want to show them where they were wrong? No, the Bible says with thanksgiving and praise in their heart, they sang praises to the Lord. See, their tribulation brought out what was in their heart. Our tribulation 
Uh, we hold grudges for years. We won't forgive. We won't do that. That's the part that God wants us to engraft into us the Word of God to change what's in the heart. He saved us now and He came into us. The water didn't create the taste in the tea. It revealed what was brought out. The devil did not tempt Eve and Adam and Eve to lie and to steal. He tempted them to live independent from God. And in our heart, we go our ways, Isaiah 53, 6, going our way, and we won't do it God's way. We must lay down our arms and surrender to God the whole way. We're coming down a path and we get saved. Someone introduces to Jesus, we get saved. Now we go on down the path and we come to a, a, a block in the road. And one way goes my ways and one way goes God's ways. And it's a direction, a dedication where I say, God, I'm dedicating my life now to go your way. I want to do it your way, God. I want to follow you. So God puts different kinds of uh, tea bags out there to make the tea change and shifts. And he tries to expose the pressure and stuff in us by putting people in our lives that cause problems. So in Acts 16, 22 through 24, we find that Paul and Silas went through these things. So what we're teaching here in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, is I've got to feed the new man, the new nature that Christ put in me. He said, Be whereby I give to us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of a divine nature. I've got to feed the mind the truth of the Word of God. I've got to free the mind of the destructive thoughts of that old man. These thoughts keep coming up from the heart, see, and I've got to, the old man will stay there, and I've got a new man there, and I've got to build the new man now. That's part of the discipleship, and then I've got to focus on eternity. 38 benefits Dr. Kesey was talking about that we have when we become a Christian. First, my name was written in the Lamb Book of Life, and then I was redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then I was sanctified, set apart for Him, and then the Bible said I was justified. And then the Bible says I had imputed to me his righteousness. And he took my sin and gave me his righteousness. 38 different benefits, all kinds of stuff that we have in Christ Jesus. So we have to help a new Christian that's born again. And Christians that have been in the church for years to grow in Christ. And we do this by using the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a... a machine ever I was in Vietnam years ago and we had to put up a fence we got a forklift 6,000 pound forklift and put poles in the ground every so many feet and then we put up the barbed wire to make a perimeter and everything and to clear it all off we had to clear the trees so we got a d7 uh, bulldozer out there a cat we called it and it was a yellow cat and I, they taught me how to operate that thing and I would go out and play with it in the afternoons and we'd clear off perimeters and stuff and lock down trees and stuff. The power of that diesel engine was so powerful that it would just clear that whole perimeter off in a matter of just uh, an hour or hundreds of feet of perimeter and everything with that bulldozer. Well, when God saves us, He says that He puts the Holy Spirit within us and that Holy Spirit is like a bulldozer. The Holy Spirit will reprove us of sin, the Bible says in John 16. The Holy Spirit reproves us of sin and the righteousness, and He starts us in the Christian growth. And as the counselors, the Christian leaders, the soul winners help disciple you, you put on the new man. And as we put on the new man, the pressure around us are drawn out of our heart uh, what is already there and the real problem goes much deeper than even our thought life it's coming from the coming from the heart and we got to renew our thought life with god's word so our greatest problem is not around us the greatest problem is within us so jesus says from within the heart a man defiles himself it comes from within so what we're going to be doing is we're not just any change will do uh, what we're talking about here today is there's a lot of things that have to take place in our life to help us to grow in Christ and help disciple other Christians in these areas. Uh, so the contents in the bag of tea uh, into, into the water 
uh, didn't change till it got hot water. So the pressure exposes how unlike Christ we really are. So all these people that you've been mad at, all these people that have hurt you and done you wrong, they don't even know it. God's using that circumstance, that problem, to bring out of your heart what's really there. And that bulldozer, the Holy Spirit, when he's plowing, if you go out and plow a field, we used to hoe, hoe the garden in West Virginia when I was up there, and it took hours to hoe that garden. But you take a plow and, and plow the garden with a D7 dozer, it'll go real deep, a foot or four deep, and it gets up that hard ground and plows it right up with the power of that engine. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit is plowing up the heart. And you'll get things right and you'll say, well, here's the fruit on the tree. It's bad fruit. But the fruit comes from a bad root. And that bad root is my heart. And as I see that and ask God to forgive you, he said, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So as I confess these sins to God and I make it right with God in these areas, what happens after that is... I'm growing in Christ, and then he'll go a little bit deeper and bring out stuff I didn't even know I had. And the preacher will preach messages and stuff that I didn't know I had. So the hot water of suffering, he says in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. You're going to go through some suffering, and the hard heart of these sufferings basically is going to reveal the nature of the hearts of these people. Paul and Silas was beaten, they were put in prison, they were bleeding, they were hurting, and they sang praises to the Lord, the Bible says. So the heart of these men had become changed to be like Christ. And as they become like Christ, the change they we find out in our lives, we're worn against that old nature, and we're trying to get rid of that old heart, thoughts and stuff, and he says, put off the new man, put off the old man, put on the new. He says, we're mortified by the deeds of the body, he says, by the spirit. And Ephesians chapter, or Romans 3, uh, 10, 8, uh, 10, 18, he says, uh, we're, Romans 8, 13, I'm sorry. He says, we're mortified the deeds of the body by the spirit. So that bulldozer of that Holy Spirit is going to plow us up and help us to grow. So we're going to war against this old man. So redeeming us from the penalty of sin was salvation, and now he's going to keep, keep us going. For the goal of the change now is to become like Christ in a humble spirit to where we can understand where people are coming from. I've been there, done that, wore the T-shirt. I know what you're going through, and we have compassion for people and help people because it's the process of the change. So we want to increase the process by becoming more like Christ and growing up as a Christian and amplify Christ's character qualities by being controlled by the Holy Spirit in our lives. And he talks about the uh, fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, generous, meekness, temperance, against such there is no... Uh, so, so what we're doing is we're showing you how to the process of growing and being what Christ wants you to be. So the natural goals reflect the natural man, but as we blend Christ into our life, we become uh, a servant for the Lord with a humble spirit where we want to do what God wants us to do. So we're going to conclude with this right now on the person of change. Remember, the Holy Spirit is not the mysterical, uh, impersonal influence in our life. The Holy Spirit comes into our heart and seals us Ephesians 1.13 says, And the Holy Spirit is one of the three persons of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the agent who shows us our needs of Christ, draws us to Jesus, makes Christ real. Then the Holy Spirit begins the work of change in our lives to become like Christ and empowers us for his service. And as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit and listen to the Spirit God talk to us, uh, he will guide us and lead us, and God will use Christian workers, Christian counselors, pastors, leaders to help us in these others. Where we're led by the Holy Spirit, uh, he says, those that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. So in Romans 8, 14, he goes on and tells us we, we're to keep growing in Christ in these areas. The process of the Holy Spirit is trying to work uh, in our lives to make us humble servants for the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm praying that God will give you grace and favor and help you in these areas 
uh, the leadership of the Holy Spirit to guide you and lead you very important and we're praying that you'll uh, let uh, let somebody work in your life as you go through these fiery trials we talked about turning this test that you're going to go through into the power of love we get we said give uh, G for give T for thanks give thanks R for rejoice E for engraft Christ commands and if A for appeal to God and T for triumph over good works. So in other words, we're using the word G-R-E-A-T, great. Give God thanks, rejoice, and graft Christ's commands, appeal to God, and triumph with victory. Go back and bless the people that hurt you. Realize that God made them an agent and they helped you to see what was in your heart and clear your conscience in 1 Timothy 1.3 and 1.7. And one nine nineteen, he talks about the clear conscience. And may God bless you and give you grace and favor as you continue your growth as a Christian and the Christian life to be like Jesus that we call sanctification. God bless you. Father, bless, anoint. I give them a hunger for your word now, Lord God, and then a hunger to pray and intercede for others, Lord God. And I pray you'll give them grace and favor in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.